Dr. Von Brown was at Fairchild his last four or five years of his life, and he was working on educational and communication satellites. And a little later, we're going to show a part of that, and I'll explain that. But I was with him at his office one day, and he said, uh, you want to go hear a lecture? I said, sure. So we went over to Johns Hopkins Applied Research Lab, and he gave a great lecture on educational and communication satellites because that's what he was working on. And then right at the end, uh, someone asked, uh, what about Mars? Are we ever going to Mars? <clears throat> so he lit up. Remember now, this is uh, 75, just a year and a half before he died. So he was getting a little feeble at that time. But he did light up, and we're going to take a look at it here in just a minute. <clears throat> And see, you'll get to hear Dr. Von Brown's uh, personal response to what about Mars. He just happened to have some stuff with him, so I think he kept it with him. <laughs> but that was certainly a thrill for me to hear him uh, give that story. So Mars was always his subjective. And then finally, the last time that he came to the aid of UAH in Huntsville was for we were trying to get the National Solar Institute into Huntsville. And I set up a Senate breakfast meeting with Senator Sparkman and Senator Baker, Senator Allen, and Ron Brown, and we even brought in Ed Teller from the H bomb, <laughs> looking for horsepower. <laughs> <coughs> Needless to say, like a recent another proposal we wrote on optics that went to Colorado. Mm. They had better sunshine. <laughs> but but Ron Brown made a classic remark. He said, Huntsville gave you the moon, we can give you the sun. So I thought that was classic. And I have that tape and the, all the transcriptions if anybody's interested in that story. So now let's take a few minutes and listen to Dr. Von Brown and see what he has to say about going to Mars from the master himself. Simple earth terminals and quite simple satellites uh, can be useful for voice communication. Oh, yes. That, that's no question, Von. And by the way, this, this was a very useful uh, demonstration rendered by the amateur satellite. When do you see man go into some other body other than the moon? Well, I think uh, the next uh, target for men other than activities, of course, in low Earth orbit, of which there would be many, will probably be Mars. Uh, we have learned a great deal about the planet Mars during the last two years, particularly through Mariner 9, which mapped the, Mar uh, the planet Mars thoroughly and discovered a few geological phenomena on Mars that nobody had expected. For example, Mars has the highest volcano in the world, in the known in solar system. <laughs> That volcano is 16 miles high and has about a total volume twice uh, as much as the largest volcano on Earth, which is the big island of Hawaii, which when measured from the bottom of the ocean is, I believe, only 11 miles high. So this is twice as big, twice as voluminous. And also there's every indication that it was active in a relatively recent geological period, just judging from the very few meteoric impacts on the crater rim. Now, another discovery made by Mariner 9 was a canyon on Mars. About, imagine Grand Canyon stretching all the way from Miami to Seattle, twice as deep and twice as wide. That is a canyon that was detected on Mars. So this too seems to show that Mars is by no means a, ge a geologically uh, dormant or dead planet, but apparently quite active. Now there's of course always a question of lack of water on Mars. There's no doubt about the fact that Mars by and large is pretty arid, but the combination of volcanic heat and of, of course also water vapor exuded by volcanic eruptions makes it entirely possible that there are oases on Mars where the environment is quite different from the average. You wouldn't expect by looking at the Sahara Desert that there could be oases with uh, palm trees, for instance. And it is for this reason that uh, um, 
many people believe that the likelihood of finding uh, even some um, not very higher forms of life, but at least some higher forms of vegetation on Mars is quite good. Now, I think needless to say, if we do find evidence of life on Mars, the rush will be on again and man probably wants to follow unmanned exploration. The first two Mars soft landers, unmanned, will be launched later this year and are scheduled to soft land on Mars in the summer of 1976, next year. So about a year and a half from now, we will be able to answer the question far more succinctly whether men will probably go to Mars. Uh, let me say this, we made a study in NASA uh, while the Apollo program was still alive on how we would send a man to Mars with modern technology. And a scheme emerged that looked something like this. You would build two interplanetary spaceships in a low Earth orbit from parts flown up there with a the shuttle, modularized parts that are stuck together in Earth orbit. You would, of course, also fuel these two interplanetary spaceships with propellant brought up by the shuttle. These ships would have a nuclear rocket engine. NASA had developed jointly with AEC a nuclear reactor engine that is, is essentially a reactor that operates at 5,000 degrees with a lot of channels leading through the reactor through which you pump liquid hydrogen. The hydrogen is heated up to 5,000 degrees and then simply permitted to expand through a convergent divergent nozzle. The exhaust velocity is about twice as high as that of a combustion hydrogen-oxygen engine such as employed in the upper stages of Saturn V. So it's really a very fuel economic system. And this nuclear rocket engine, one in each of these two interplanetary ships, would go through several maneuvers. One, drive the ship out of Earth's orbit on a trans-Mars trajectory. And there would be a free coasting period, several months, by the way, going to Mars. Then the second maneuver would be the capture maneuver of the ship into a circumarchian orbit. And the two ships would remain in that circumarchian orbit, pretty much like we kept the Apollo Command and Service module in orbit around the moon, and made the landing with a separate LEM vehicle. You remember how it was done in Apollo. Now, there would also be a separate Martian version of the LEM, a chemically powered vehicle capable of making a soft landing on Mars and the upper stage flying back to the two ships left circling in March in orbit for a rendezvous and docking maneuver. And this, circumar this March in limb would then be abandoned, and the return flight would be conducted with the nuclear-powered ship again. There would be a third power maneuver driving the ships out of the March in orbit, and finally a fourth maneuver capturing them back into the, into the Earth's gravitational field from which the crew would be recovered again with a shuttle. That's essentially the scheme. Now, such a program would roughly cost as much as the Apollo program, not more, but also not less. And uh, I think uh, it would probably not involve three people, but uh, a dozen people going to Mars, because the, state, uh, the travel time of the entire expedition would be on the order of a year and a half, so you would like to take a cook and a doctor and everything else along. You know, it's a little more like a, an expedition uh, on a sailing ship uh, 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 times of Magellan. <laughs> well, I tell you, uh, women's lib will see to it that... Uh, uh, well, speaking of women, by the way, I believe that before the end of the century we're going to have a research station on the moon. There was, of course, also be lady scientists, and the first baby will be born on the moon before you know it. Happens. I promised Dr. Mm. from Brown mm. Secretary to get him in his car at 3.17 and a half, and mm -hmm. since our <laughs> clocks are not synchronized, I think we'd better quit now. Thank you.